Okay, so uh, I suppose it's my turn. And I've been asked to say something about Shiite minorities in, in the Middle East, Shiite Muslims in the, middle, in the MENA region. Uh, and I was, okay, I'm coming from a, from a project, we have a research project on authority developments in Shiism, which is a multidisciplinary project. We, it's me, it's an anthropologist from Denmark, it's a, a sociologist, another Swedish sociologist. We are a, a number of people involved in this project. So what I will do now is to give some, uh, uh, I will present some of the findings from this project, basically. <laughs> Uh, and my idea is to, to be able to go through these four uh, items, and we will see if I, if I, uh, if I can manage uh, with the time given. Uh, so first of all, then, some uh, initial remarks on the notion of Shiite minorities in the Middle East. I mean, of course, uh, globally speaking, Shiite uh, Muslims constitute a small minority of, of uh, the Muslim community, but if we speak about the Middle Eastern region, uh, Shiites are not a small uh, minority. Uh, they constitute almost up to 40% of the people living in this area. And uh, in some of the countries, um, most notably then Iran and Iraq, Shiites form quite big majorities. Uh, so it's interesting then that there is a presentation on this minority workshop on Shiite minorities, but not one on Sunni minorities. Because in, in Iran, of course, uh, the Sunnis are uh, minorities and treated as, as such uh, in the Iranian case. So if I'm just, before I start, want to linger a little bit on this fact, I think it has many reasons and it reflects many different things. Uh, I mean, the fact that we think so much of Shiism and Shiites as a minority group. And one, of course, is the power situation. As we heard yesterday, I mean, minority reflects numbers, but it also reflects power. Um, and in terms of power, of course, Shiites have, in many of the countries of, of the Middle Eastern region, have uh, less political, wielded less political power than other, uh, than the Sunni communities. But it's not only this. Uh, and of course, it's also uh, so that scholarship of, uh, in Islamic studies, for instance, reflect the sort of interior logic, power distribution within Muslim communities. So uh, the majority, those who are in power, are also deemed more interesting and more representative than those who are not, are, are not in power, which is a, in itself an interesting thing. But it's also the fact that Shiism has a self-image, or within Shiism, there is a self-image of being a minority. And this is obvious in the imagery, even in a state like Iran, I mean, where Shiites wield political power, they, have, they are a superpower, I mean connected to this group, even there the imagery and the self-image of Shi uh, Shiism then is this. I mean, the small minority in a hostile world fighting, struggling against for truth against uh, a majority that is against them. Or this one, to just put another image. I mean, Shiism as a small plant in the desert growing against all odds. So this is an important sort of starting point. And then the background for the project that I'm, I'm going to tell you something about is that now the situation for Shiism, as you all know, has changed dramatically since the fall of Saddam Hussein and the re-emergence of alternative forms of Shiism than the Iranian one. The Iranian Khomeini's version of Shiism has been immensely dominating in Shiite discourse internationally since the uh, Iranian revolution. And this has now changed, and also with the Arab Springs and all the, the risings and the, the increased position of Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, and of course uh, the whole Iraqi situation and this global struggle between Saudi and Iranian influence in the region, Shiism has become on top of the agenda in a way that it hasn't been for quite some time. Okay, so I would say something first then about discussions among the clerical elite. So, so the idea is to say something about what's going on in Shiism in this region. Um, first then on the sort of elite, clerical elite level, and then something on the more grassroots uh, level. So first then something about the clerical elite debates. As you all know, in, and I will now speak about Twelver Shiism. In Twelver Shiism, there is the idea that uh, after the occultation, the disappearance, uh, the hiding of the twelfth 
imam, um, the authority, jurisprudential authority, passes on to uh, Shiite clergy. This is the sort of uh, a basic idea. In the absence of the true leader, who is still the leader, who lives in absence, but in his absence, it is the, the, authori the authority passes on to, um, uh, yeah, to uh, jurisprudential experts, the ulama. And in the 19th century, this idea sort of developed into the institution of the marja'i taqlid, which is the basic idea that every individual Shiite, uh, it is the duty of every individual Shiite to choose uh, the marja, that is the, the source of emulation, the scholar who he or she thinks is most fit to fill the, the position of the imam, basically. And this sort of creates a very um, strong infrastructure in Shiism, where every individual Shiite person who is at least uh, a pious person will be involved in a structure of sort of clerical hierarchy, belonging, asking some, uh, some cleric in the, in the local mosque, who should I follow, who should I emulate, and he will then uh, point forward to, to, to some, uh, some marja. Okay, and central to this notion then is the idea of the vilaya, the governance, the notion of governance. And of course, in Shiite uh, school of thought, the imams had governance. They were given by God the right to govern. Uh, and they are the right, righteous uh, uh, wielders of vilaya. And then the big debate then is what kind of vilaya, what kind of governance, what kind of rulership is given to the ulama, to the, to the jurisprudential experts in the absence of the imams. And, and here there's a, a debate. And the classical position that developed alongside the Marja'i Taqlid institution in the 19th century, and which was, for instance, represented by Sheikh Ansari, who is one of the big uh, thinkers of this time, uh, is that the vilaya, the, the leadership of the uh, ulama, is limited. So uh, tradition simply explained, this is a quote from, from Ansari, uh, the duties of the fuqaha in respect to religious ordinances and not their being like prophets and the imams. There's something strange about this translation, but anyway. May the blessed da, da, da. In the sense that they possess authority over the people and their properties. In brief, one will have to accomplish an impossible task before one can prove that it's obligatory to <coughs> obey a faqih like an imam. So the level of the uh, fuqaha is lower than that of the imam. This is also supported by Ayatollah Khoi, who is a, a prominent Iraqi uh, cleric in the 20th century. It says that during the occultation of the imam, the vilaya of the jurist cannot be established by reference to any proof. The vilaya is exclusive to the prophet and the imams. Uh, okay. So the idea is that the jurisprudence have some authority in jurisprudential matters, in things which are not the type of issues that are not brought to court. Uh, yes. Uh, and this is the sort of standard, used to be the standard Shiite interpretation. Until then, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini came in, uh, and in the in 1970s, uh, sort of developed a new understanding of this uh, velaya of the jurisprudence, which is called the velaya tefari, uh, and which can be translated then as the absolute authority of the jurisprudence. But even Khomeini, when he developed this principle, was not was sort of in line with the traditional stance. And in the early days of the Iranian Revolution in 1979, from which this quote comes, um, here, uh, Khomeini expresses it like this. The religious scholars do not wish to become prime minister or president, and indeed it is not in their interest to do so. They do, however, have a role to play. The role they have is one of supervision, not of assuming executive positions without the proper expertise. The expertise of the religious scholars lies in the area of Islamic law. So even in the beginning of, of Khomeini's uh, thinking, he was sort of in line with uh, traditional Shiism. But during the first decade then of the Islamic Republic, given the wars and all the internal conflicts and the, you know, all the co uh, political things that happened, uh, Khomeini sort of increased his understanding or uh, changed his understanding of the importance of the cleric. And in 1988, then 10 years later, after the war and you know, everything, he states like this, I should state that the government, which is a part of the absolute deputyship of the prophet, is one of the primary injunctions of Islam. 
and has priority over all other secondary injunctions, even prayers, fasting, and Hajj. So here what happens is that there's a sort of a scholarly reinterpretation of, of Shiite fiqh, where um, um, the governance it becomes at the level of the other vajibat, the other uh, obligatory duties. Okay, so now this view then of Khomeini became very dominant because of, for political reasons. The Shiites in other countries were oppressed during Saddam in Iraq, and Najaf was quenched by, by the force of Saddam Hussein. So, uh, and uh, uh, Khomeini and Iran was a superpower with lots of money. So this became the dominant position that spread across the Shiite world. Uh, although, of course, the other uh, interpretation, the traditional stance also remained. And when Saddam Hussein fell and Najaf, the, the Shiite center of learning in Iraq, could come back, the voice of this senior cleric, Ayatollah Sistani, who is the most senior and most emulated of all the Marja Taklids in the Shiite world, became more uh, heard in the world and more sort of it appeared, Swedish people learned about this person, for instance. And his position is, of course, in line with Ayatollah Khoi and uh, Ansari and the other uh, clerics that I mentioned. So, for instance, he says he's, he's the student of Khoi. If a Fari wants to possess Vilaya in the state's administration, he must secure the people's general approval. So this is the stance of, of Sistani. We have a democratic solution. Shiism is a democratic religion, he says. It means that in terms of actual political power, this is a, a matter of elections and public elections. And maybe he opted for this interpretation because the Shiites are a majority in Iraq, so it would help them anyway if, if they were democratic. We, we, you never know. But this is his, his uh, jurisprudential stance in this question, which goes against then the Velayat Fari. Now, it is the habit of these uh, scholars to never openly question each other. So they will not openly say that they are against Velayat Fari, but if you look at their interpretations, they have different uh, positions. Which means now that one of the major debates then in the Shiite world, in Iran and in Iraq and in Bahrain and in these small countries, in Lebanon, in, in Saudi Arabia, is, and in, in the Gulf, is this sort of tension between these two interpretational stances. Are we for or against the Iranian understanding? And this is partly a, a matter of jurisprudential discussions. What is sort of the correct jurisprudential uh, understanding of the sources? But it is also a political debate. Because, uh, so you could say that these are the two sort of proponents then. We have Sistani, who stands for the quietest, it's called the quietest stance, where, where the clerics are withdrawn and they come with advice, and sometimes they, they interfere in politics, but very, very rarely. Whereas Khamenei, of, of course, stands for the opposite. But one of the arguments for following Khamenei is not only that, that his jur jurisprudential interpretation should be sort of better, but that he actually wields power. So some would say that, OK, Sistani might be on a higher level in terms of jurisprudential uh, capacity, but Khamenei has an army. Uh, so who should we follow, the Shiite leader who has an army and who can actually do something, or the Shiite leader who cannot do anything except issuing advice. So there's a political and a military and sort of uh, realpolitik kind of aspect of this discussion, which is very prominent, and which also has a history, hundreds of years of Shiite jurisprudence. There is a pragmatic side to it, and uh, I don't have time to go into that, but that was actually the beginning of Shiite jurisprudence in, in Iran during the Safavid times. Okay, so one more interesting debate in, in the clergy level. And that has to do, connects to this idea of democracy. Because as you know, in the, in the Iranian Velayat e Fari system, there are two sides. Okay, so Iran, Iranian constitution is basically uh, a copy of the Belgian constitution. It's a, it's a republic, democratic republic. But then there is this quite significant amendment of Islamic uh, rule. So there's sort of a democratic side and a theocratic side, you can say. And the question is now, which one legitimizes the other? Which one is the strongest? And this is sort of, uh, there's, in Khomeini's thinking, there is ambivalence here. So you can find proof for, for, for both sides, and it's not obvious 
which one is actually following the original intentions of Khomeini or anything, but it's, it's ambiguous. And these two uh, scholars then are, are interesting representatives of different sides. Because uh, uh, Mesboy Yazdi is then he's a conservative right-wing cleric he's, um, um, who argues that the democratic side uh, is sort of subordinate to the theocratic side. So for, for instance, to give an example of this, he said once that uh, the authority of the president comes because the president reflects the light of the Rahbar, of the supreme leader. So the president has authority because the leader's sort of theocratic authority sort of reflects on him somehow. Whereas uh, Montazeri, who is a very pro he's dead now, but he was a very prominent uh, scholar. He was one of the authors of the Iranian constitution. He, uh, in, in, in the later days of his life, went in a complete opposite direction. So he would say, for instance, that uh, when we speak about Velayat, we have to look at the Imams. And the foremost of the Imams, of course, was Ali. Or the, one of the most important was Ali. And what did Ali do? Okay. So it's the Shiite belief that Ali had uh, the divine right to rule over the Muslims and the world. This was the right given to him. But as we all know, he was not elected by the Muslims after the death of the Prophet. The, the, they elected Abu Bakr. So what did Ali do? He stepped back. And then when uh, uh, Abu Bakr died and there was a new election, he offered his services again and was not elected, and he stepped back. And he didn't actually claim power, the, 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 the caliph power, until he was elected. So this means that Ali himself chose, I mean, it's very anachronistic to speak of a democracy here, but you, you see the principles. He chose the democratic principle above the theocratic principle in his own choice of power. And this for Montazer then becomes the sort of role model for how the Islamic Republic should uh, should develop, which means that democracy is what legitimizes the theocratic divine. God wants democracy in order to have his rules uh, come true. Okay, I'm, I'm hopelessly uh, optimistic when it comes to time, but I just want to say one thing, and then that there is another challenge among uh, if we come to the grassroots level. Uh, because this is one discussion then when it comes to Shiite leadership, who, is, who, is, who wields religious authority in Shiism. One is the clerical debates, the different interpretations. But another type of challenge that is maybe more prominent and which is most uh, uh, detectable in Iran has to do with sort of a, a youth culture that questions the importance of these clerics altogether. And who say that, well, you know, they, have, they do what they do, and uh, I don't have time for this. Uh, but uh, one aspect of this youth culture then is, uh, is not, okay, one is secularism. People become secular and they question the whole thing and they don't think about the, the mullahs or anything. But another type of youth culture that questions the authority of the clerics is uh, strictly religious, but in a different sense. And this is then the, charismat the growth of charismatic movements within Shiism, particularly in Iran. So you would have people, young people, who are, um, um, they are, they are Shiite, but they, uh, and they are religious and they are pious, but they are also part of a sort of a global youth culture that emphasizes <coughs> music and social life and individualism and finding your own style and all these kind of things that we can see in the, uh, globally. And what happened in the, in the political recent history of Iran was that uh, during the presidency of uh, Khatami, who was a president who sort of was a reformist, who opened up this country, what happened was that the access to Western youth culture, because this coincided with the internet. So the internet came and Khatami came. And suddenly, Iranian young people had an access to this international youth culture as much as Swedish or whatever, American, young people almost. Uh, 
so this, uh, the sort of people were playing guitars in parks and all this kind of music came in and they were listening to Western music and everything. And this obviously became a big threat then to the more conservative sides of the Islamic Republic. So what happened was that they started to nourish a type of uh, charismatic Shiism that sort of connected to this global trend of youth culture. Uh, and I will just give you one clip since we, I thought I should bring some music. Mm -hmm. And this will just give you a feeling. You know, in Shiism, there is a traditional tradition of, of beating your chest and, and mourning Hussein. Yeah. And just watch now how this has developed in the Islamic Republic. So this is Mahmoud Karimi, one of the great Madas. It's very groovy. So, it's an Arabic. Yeah, we are always in your, uh, we are dependent on your care, Abbas. Yeah. You get the feeling. Uh, here are some of the pictures of these guys. These are madas. These are sort of preachers. Now, the, the, this movement then with these madas and this kind of... It, Hundreds, thousands of people come to these. The, I started seeing this when I found that people in their shops, instead of having a Khomeini or a Sistani, they would have this guy. And they would argue, we are pious Shiites. We are religious. Look, we have this guy. Uh, and they then have some pop star qualities around these, uh, uh, these people. And they challenge then uh, the authority of the clerics, not by having another interpretational stance in jurisprudential matters, but by sort of shifting the focus of what being a Shiite Muslim is about. And if you ask them, the followers of these, about who is their jurisprudential, Marja, they would say, well, I would pick someone who likes Hussein. Something like this is what they would usually say. Okay, well, there were some other things, but thank you. Questions? <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, of course, you didn't have time for all of this, but one major, one other, in, from my point of view, important discussion is happening also, is not just whether you're going to go with Khomeini or Sistani, but it is the Iranization of Shiism. Yes. And there's a counter, uh, one, one counter reaction is, are the Arabic Arab Shiites who say, you know, we, we want to be citizens in our countries, we do not want to be in the army of any... Uh, uh, and and it, it, one example, prominent example of it is, uh, is Hezbollah in Lebanon, where they put more, often sometimes more Iranian flags than Lebanese flags. Yes. And, and, uh, and, and the, it's sort of creating a... One, on the one level, the debate on the, the merger, whether you accept the uh, Wilayat Fakim or not, and how many Shiites, in fact, believe in, accept it or not, is, is, I don't know, you probably can tell, but many would say in Lebanon, many Shiites do not. Probably the yeah, majority yeah. do not, but they don't have the voice. The voice is in Hezbollah. But an argument is this where Shiism is becoming an Iranian thing. And, and there is, there is a... Yeah, I mean, this is a huge... Uh, I, I, I totally agree with this. And of course, now, I'm in Iranian studies, so I have this Iranian uh, take on this. But as soon as you leave the Iranian borders, uh, I mean, the, the view of Shiite interests is, is pictured completely different. And the view of Iran, I mean... Uh, uh, I mean, when we were in Jordan, for instance, we were in Jordan, but their view of this is that the Iranians are the Safavids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's connected to the Safavid sort of Iranian you know, uh, crazy expansion. Yeah. The battle again, I, you know, 
they invoked the battle of the Arabs against the Persians. Some of them say did it. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And yeah, so of course, there, I mean, there's such a multi layered uh, story here. Yeah, I totally agree with this. So uh, it's really interesting how you link all these Margier scholars to the youth culture at the end. What I want to, you use the word uh, charismatic, is that a Bavarian notion or is that you just use it in a neutral way here? Uh, in what sense this? Well, I use, bec uh, I use it from a sort of uh, history of religions uh, perspective. Where it's, it's not strictly in a Weberian sense, actually. It's more as a type of uh, a typification of types of uh, religious style in is Christianity. It, is it ritual? Yes. Okay. So this is in the sense I used it. But I think it would work also, actually, in a Weberian style, although even the Marjas have charismatic authority in a Weberian sense. So they, uh, it's not so, it, it would be easy to say, okay, they stand for legal, rational, and, and the others no, for charismatic, it, but it's not that it easy. It makes sense to me for the first yeah. category, but in terms of the youth, and how this performance now is yeah. being part of this new culture on the ground. I just want to hear what, uh, is it based on the data or just a, a neutral term that you use there? That this was my, the charismatic was my term for this type of sort of uh, emotion intense okay. uh, uh, religiosity circling around preachers. And th that would, I th suppose, be taken from charismatic Christianity, yeah, from Pentecostalism, this kind of movements. But what's interesting is that, uh, and this was sort of what connected the two parts, is that when uh, uh, this, this threat, this challenge against the, the, the clerics, mm -hmm that happens, uh, I will show you this. This is a level of uh, the secularity index in Iran. And uh, I mean, this is a very problematic figure in many ways, but it comes from World Value Survey. And it shows that there are um, a massive movement towards secularity or secularism, as they define it, which is a problematic way, in Iran. So this is like. In 2009, uh, the median median is that how said the, the median is at uh, at a much higher level than it used to be just five years before. So there's a secularism, and there is this uh, uh, challenge of different interpretation. There's also the challenge that comes from charismatic uh, youth groups. And one of the things that happens is that uh, an option is sort of starting to grow in Qom because this is my fieldwork is based in Qom. And uh, that some clerics, senior clerics, for instance, uh, this one, Parizade, uh, uh, he would argue that, well, actually, we never wanted to have the power. This is uh, something that comes. We never, we had to take the reins for a while because uh, politics was going so bad. We had to do something. But now when it's settled, we will withdraw to the quietest position. So there's this reinterpretation of the Khomeini's legacy going on, also among very established uh, clerics. There's uh, one final question for me. Yeah, uh, during the centuries, um, the Shia have, as the Shia leaders, have, uh, religious leaders, have been very flexible in giving fatwas to all kinds of, of groups and they are considered as Shia. Huh? You have the Alevi, you have the, uh, yeah. and so on, all over. Uh, and in, in those um, contexts, uh, they are also very flexible regarding to pick up to see the similarity. And now, then this uh, influence of Iran is growing to also mobilize it, uh, the identification in that way. And not, not underlining the differences more, but yeah. you are uh, connected to us. Yes. But I think that in Iran, one of the main sort of political ambitions from the Islamic Revolution onwards has been to speak for more than just Iranian Shiites. This has been a very strong thing. And so they would do a lot to include their political allies with whatever rhetoric uh, needed. Uh, but of course, this, um, this, the, this sort of outsider view of of, of the Alawites and the Houthis and the Debians are connected by theology or something, that's very far-fetched. Exactly. Um, but political allies can be friends. 
Um, if, if you need some rhetoric for that, you will have to yes, produce it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you.